So good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to start with a couple of questions. The first question I'd like you to do is put your hands up if well-being is something that's important to you in your own life. Pretty much everyone in the room. Keep your hands up. Now keep your hands up if well-being is something that you want organizational leaders and policymakers to take into consideration when they're making decisions that affect consumers, employees, and citizens at large. Okay, so across the room, we're in broad agreement that well-being is something that matters to us in our own lives and that we want people in positions of power to take seriously. You can put your hands out now. <laughs> What I've had to guess, though, is that we're probably less in agreement when we all put our hands up about what we actually meant when we said we, that well-being was important to us. What well-being is, what the good life constitutes, is something that great thinkers have wrestled with for thousands of years, from Confucius to Buddha to Aristotle. And up to today, scholars like myself spend lots of time and energy and even whole careers trying to define and examine well-being. Usefully, for our purposes, Back in 1984, Derek Parfit distilled down lots of the philosophical debate around what well-being is into three broad accounts. These accounts basically say that you're well when you get what you need, or you're well when you get what you prefer, or you're well when you actually feel well. So the first account, you're well when you get what you need, well, what do you actually need? According to this account, we can make up a list of basic human needs that are essential for human flourishing. Things that typically go on these lists are things like shelter, education, income. And policymakers implicitly, if not explicitly, come at the question of what well-being is and how to promote it through the lens of an objective list of what you need. The second account of well-being says you're well when you get what you prefer. This is typically how neoclassical economics thinks about well-being. And uh, <laughs> sorry, the neoclassical economics thinks about well-being. And economists really care about income at the individual level and GDP at the country level, not because they think that um, money matters so much in and of itself, but because the bigger the budget that you have, the more of the preferences you can satisfy, and preference satisfaction is at the heart of well-being. The last account of well-being says you're well when you get what you, when you feel well. This is how psychologists come at the question of what is well-being. And feelings consist of positive emotions like happiness and joy and contentment and negative emotions like anxiety, stress and worry, but also what we call eudaimonic sentiments, feelings of meaning and purpose on, one, on the one hand, and then on the flip side, things like futility and boredom. Three very different takes on what well-being is. All of them are not without limitation. So the first account that says you're well when you get what you need, well, who gets to decide what you need? Is it policymakers? Is it you for yourself or us together in some sort of democratic process? And are the needs fixed in a, at any point in time? Are there these basic human needs that never change? Or does it evolve with time? And so a nice example of this is internet connection. 20 years ago, most of you would not have said that internet connection was a basic human need, but we might have more of a debate about it today. It's also the case that on this list of needs, when we've got things like income and shelter and human connection, can we trade these things off against one another? Are they all equally important? And when policymakers have to make decisions with scarce resources, how do they prioritize between these different needs? Preferences also have issues. It turns out we've learned from behavioral science that preferences are not always all that stable. They can often be influenced by irrelevant contextual cues. You'll have found this out if you've ever gone shopping while being really hungry. Your hunger in the moment makes you buy more food and less healthy food than you would have otherwise because you're being cued by that momentary feeling of hunger, even though it shouldn't matter for your consumption over the course of the week. It's also the case that people's preferences shift in time and in response to experience. So if I'd asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up, you would have given me a fairly different answer than you might give me today. And that's normal, but it does ask the question, which preferences at which points in your life elicited under which context should we be trying to maximize if we want to make people well? The last issue with preferences is that people often have preferences for things that don't always seem to be that good for them. This is true of addictive goods, but it's also true when we overconsume, leading to problems of obesity, or we overspend, leading to problems of uh, unsustainable amounts of debt. People's preferences, even when they're satisfied, don't always seem to deliver well-being. The last account of well-being that says you're well when you feel well, well, this raises questions of how we can measure how people actually feel and do this over the long run so that we can understand how that plays out. 
There's also issues around whether we want to be promoting positive feelings all the time. Is that something that's desirable, even realistic? And when we think of these different types of feelings, between happiness on the one side and meaning on the other, what kind of balance should we be trying to strike between those different feelings? And is that balance the same for all people, at all points in their life, across all different cultures? So three different accounts of what well-being is, none of them without issue. It is worth mentioning that even though they come at the question of what is well-being from a very different perspective, they might actually lead to some of the same answers. So people often have preferences for things that end up on objective lists, like shelter, education, income. You can also put happiness and feelings of meaning onto a list of things that are basic human needs. And so different accounts will often offer similar answers, but not always. In my own area of research, we use what are called subjective well-being measures to get at that third account of well-being that says you're well when you feel well. These are measures that reflect on how people think about their lives and feel as they go about them to try to understand how they, how they feel and what determines that. So we ask questions like, overall, how satisfied are you with your life? Or with parts of your life, like your job or your income or your relationships? And then we map how those reports of satisfaction relate to the actual circumstances of people's lives and how those things interact with individual factors like your own personality or the value sets that you hold to try to understand what promotes or impedes feelings of satisfaction. We also ask more experiential measures. In big representative surveys, we'll ask people questions like, overall, how happy did you feel yesterday? Or how anxious did you feel? How stressed did you feel? And we also inquire into more directly into people's experiences using what are called experience sampling methods. These basically involve pinging people, typically on their mobile, and asking them questions about the moment that they're in. Who are they with? What are they doing? Where are they? And ultimately, how do they feel? And using these methods, we can map how people are spending their time and the company that they keep and the context in which they are in and how that actually impacts on how they're living their lives and feeling in the moment. Over the past several decades, using these kinds of subjective well-being measures, we've managed to glean lots and lots of insights into what determines how people feel and what the good life is and what makes happy people happy. But more recently, in some of my own work and the work of other scholars, we've turned to using these measures to try to understand the lives of people who are living far from the good life, those that either evaluate their lives very poorly or experience a lot of negative emotion day to day. In a recent study with colleagues here at the LSE and at the University of Birmingham, we've used the Gallup World Poll, which is the biggest well-being survey in the world, to look at patterns in well-being or ill-being across the world. It has over 1.8 million responses to these kinds of subjective well-being questions over 10 years across 164 countries. And it lets us really understand where in the world people are most at risk of being unwell. So here is looking at a question of low life evaluations. The Gallup World Poll collects data using what's called a Cantrell ladder, and it asks people to place themselves on a ladder from the worst possible life to the best possible life. And in this analysis, we've looked at people who've placed themselves on the last four rungs of that ladder, saying that their life is close to being the worst possible. And we can look across the globe at different patterns in well-being, identifying places where there's really, really high proportions of people responding to the question, of where their life is on that ladder as being quite close to the worst possible. This is true of many places in Africa and in South Asia, but across the world there's people reporting these kinds of experiences. When we look at low experience well-being, fairly similar patterns but not exactly the same. These are people who report feeling angry, sad, stressed and worried yesterday. Um, and we see that there's lower proportions of people responding that they feel all of those emotions yesterday, but there's, there's similar patterns emerging from across the globe as to where people are feeling those feelings in high proportions. We can also look across time. We've got over 10 years of data on these kinds of measures, and we can see from evaluative, so that latter question that I mentioned, the trend has been fairly stable. There was, of course, a blip in and around the pandemic when people were reporting higher levels of well-being, lower levels of well-being, but overall the trend has been fairly stable over the last 10 years. When we look at experiential well-being, however, it seems that there's been a steady rise in the amount of negative emotion that people have been experiencing across the last 10 years, leading to what some people are calling a real crisis in well-being. When we try to understand and model what's going on behind these trends, we see that 
income, of course, that the, the economists would care about does seem to predict part of what's happening here. So too does GDP at the country level. And when we add things that would typically appear on objective lists, like health, like social connectedness, like education, they're helping to explain these patterns too. But there's much more that's left unexplained. There's a lot more that goes into low well-being and low experiences day to day that we can't predict based on what would typically show up in a preference satisfaction account or in an objective list. And so our next step is to really understand what else is going on. So I started the talk with this question of how important is well-being to you in your own life and on a societal level. And what I'd like to hopefully have convinced you of at this point, that equally important in how much we emphasize well-being is what we actually mean and being clear about what we mean when we talk about well-being. The three accounts that I presented to you based on needs, based on preferences and based on feelings, they all have limitations, but they also have something important to offer. And in the face of this crisis in well-being, it's really important that we glean every insight possible based on these different accounts to try to understand what the good life is and how to promote it for everyone. 